So uh, I'm back again um, here and now uh, very seriously in the in media stress with our fifth series of the architecture lectures called uh, Reflections on Architecture. This year with a Slovenian architecture and Slovenian architect. Um, for the very beginning, I have to say that the project was supported using public funding by Slovak Arts Council. Uh, today, uh, I'm very happy that uh, our guest will be the fascinating architect Marusha Zorec uh, from Ljubljana, from Area Architectura, uh, architect um, with a great experience, uh, with a very sophisticated and uh, sensual uh, work. And uh, I, I hope that you will enjoy the lecture of Marusha very much. Marusha, uh, uh, let me welcome you in our, our digital virtual platform. <laughs> I'm really very, very happy that you, um, you are here with us. Uh, even if you are not really with us, <laughs> only in, uh, through, through our uh, technical um, bridge, let's say. So I will not work, uh, I will not talk anymore and I will uh, give the floor to you. Please, uh, you can start with your, with your presentation right now and we are very happy to, to be your audience. Yeah. Um. Hello, um, I would like to thank uh, you, Henrietta and uh, Monica, to inviting me to, to share this lecture with you. I'm honored to show you what I do. I would be more pleased to visit your city. I have never been there, although I know fascinating photos from the modernism of Bratislava. And uh, just recently we were participating in a competition for a wonderful spa building, I hope you will get some good, good proposals. It's a wonderful tasks that you were given um, to us. Um, well, um, I, uh, I work uh, as an independent architect for almost, um, for more than 20 years and uh, starting with very, very small scale projects, uh, slowly getting to a little bit bigger ones, but uh, Mostly, i am been working with really um, re 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 uh, innovation and, uh, let's say, requalification of the existing. And when I started to lecture, I was, I started also to think, uh, who am I really, uh, where does this, what I'm doing really come from? And um, you start to, to reflect what you are somehow intuitively doing and uh, here i'm sharing with you the photo of uh, from the room of my childhood uh, i was born in the northern part of slovenia and grew up there in an area that was that has has still has a very large open uh, space behind the house and very open view and lots of freedom around um, that i was used to um, to live in uh, to know every tree almost you see here and to appreciate also the the existing um, built uh, environment uh, I was growing in a lot. So I have to tell you that this childhood in a way left a strong impact on what I am, who I am and the way I'm thinking and, and working. What is important to me is of course the strength of the place and uh, the community that is living uh, in in this place. So I will try to to show you through things we did in all these uh, years, of course, together with my team. I have wonderful uh, people in my office who are like all of them partners in all the projects. I'm not working completely alone, as you know, in architecture. This is today not possible. Um, just a moment. Marusha, I'm, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. Yes, can you please close or move this small icon with, with uh, I don't know, this um, blue? <laughs> you should, should like hide it or? Yes, great, great, great. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, um, 
uh, two years ago, um, we were invited by the Grafton Architects to participate uh, on the Venice Biennale and uh, we were invited to show what we do and how we think. So we named our project Unveiling the Hidden, which means that through our process of, of working, we try to bring forward all the traces of the past that is somehow hiding in the buildings that we discover and we try to uh, prepare them for the new life in our time. So, uh, like Josef Brodsky here is telling that every surface is uh, seeking uh, for dust because dust, in a way, is uh, the, <clears throat> the presence of the flesh and blood of the time. That means <clears throat> dust is, of course, telling us the story that happened inside the buildings. So, how to approach to the buildings, not to remove the dust, not to remove the smell, not to remove all the memories that these buildings are carrying with them. It's not uh, an easy work. In our pavilion that we constructed in the place of Arsenale, we also wanted to keep the existing wall and inside this we placed different panels with uh, somehow in engraved um, voids of our project uh, engraved into a structure that is somehow also connected with one of our projects that you are going to see the redevelopment of the uh, castle of building in, in Ormos. Uh, this structure was somehow created in front of the existing wall so that the visitors could walk through, see these um, conceptual models and of course sit in front in the bench and through this, try to understand that what is interesting us is, of course, uh, also a free floor plan or a free movement through the spaces that we tried to uh, create or recreate or reopen and reorganize. This is the theme of my um, partners at that time in the space of Biennale, and this is the back side on which we try to present. Um, um, I think 15 topics that we have selected uh, that somehow through which I think um, my or our work could be um, um, presented or which are somehow the focus we look for in every project we, we, we do. Um, I will show you this, uh, these topics uh, later, but on all those panels we showed the these topics through our project and on the right side you can see also a panel that is of course connected with our ancestors. That means the generations of architects that worked um, in our space, in our country before us. And this um, work and research of these architects uh, from let's say modern period of Slovenia has a lot uh, uh, influence uh, on on the way of uh, our thinking. And one of those most important buildings um, among them is the roof, uh, the roof of the architect Otto Nugovets that was built in 1974. Um, and it's a roof that is covering a ruin of an ancient church from the eighth century. This roof is a modernistic roof. It stands only on two columns and it's somehow hanging above the ground, so the air and the void is freely uh, flowing below it. Sometimes the river who is flooding the area also floods all the area beneath the, the, the roof. Uh, this roof is also a modern interpretation of the wooden hayracks that are so typical for our countryside and through this shows how modern architecture can be close to the tradition and as well built in a completely modern way. This roof for me is also the best reinterpretation of the topic of Biennale last time. This was the topic of free space or of freedom, which for me in, in, um, in architecture plays a very important role. And it touches also the field of preserving and fights to keep this modernistic uh, heritage alive Therefore, we showed these examples of beautiful Slovenian 
modernistic architecture of the architects from the 60s that are very much endangered in our times and we lost a lot of this architecture you see the buildings somehow that we lost uh, through the changes uh, that started in the 90s till today we lost many buildings of them that were replaced for instance this one below by the architecture that does not deserve the name so with our colleagues we fight to keep this architecture uh, one to one on the site uh, and through this to <coughs> to have the chance to show us and of course the future generation that this architecture is a very high quality architecture as you see uh, the building of Edvard Rauninger for instance here that we saved through our let's say protests and fights uh, instead of the bookstore now here is a restaurant but the interior of the building remained or you see another building of Raunikar, which was redeveloped by young architects and now showing all the qualities of the, its transparent, transparent um, ground floor. So this is also part of my activities and uh, somehow shows also some connection, I believe, with the area um, you all come from. The struggle from the period uh, of the Political changes um, is, is uh, I think, a very important issue of the work we have to do. But coming back to the topics that we presented in Biennale, of course, after freedom, the other topic was the primeval space. This is the space somehow coming from our, let's say, um, unconsciousness. And this is the image of a lake that I go often, that is a space like from the prehistoric times with its uh, glacier landscape um, somehow um, um, is uh, in um, somehow is uh, strong uh, has strong effect on all our emotions um, this is a model of, of a mosque that we did and uh, shows also the topic of silence that we try to seek in, in our buildings and materiality through this, uh, uh, introducing also the scale of the human being and uh, the light as one of the topics that brings, of course, life to our buildings is a very important issue that we uh, uh, work a lot uh, with that, how light is in fact uh, constructing the space. Um, Another topic that uh, we work a lot is, of course, the void, the space in between the walls, how this void is uh, shaped by all the borders that we try to create, whether uh, cleaning or, let's say, voiding out the space or constructing it completely new. We, worked a lot, we work a lot with the buildings that carry with them very strong stories like the House of Plechnik and an old monastery you here see on the right side that we are just now having the construction site here in this place um, and trying to, to keep these stories or uh, of course uh, implementing them in our, uh, in our buildings. Uh, in that the place uh, it has a strong uh, importance, the place where we um, come to and the place we try to create with our uh, with our buildings. Um, often the buildings are uh, re, um, were redeveloped through time so very uh, often many layers were clad one about each other and um, through this uh, in all our research or construction we try to remove them and through that to understand the, the buildings that we are working on. We try to present them as much as possible and of course um, um, keep them as a part of our new uh, intervention. This for instance is a model of layers of an old town of Aidoschina that we were working on. Uh, I think with all the renovation processes that we are working the concept is still very important part of, uh, of our work. Uh, you can't renovate without the concept as you cannot build uh, a new building without it. So 
a strong idea what you are doing, uh, how you are connecting, how you are presenting, how you are putting old and new together, um, needs to be uh, shaped in a very clear idea, which in architecture I think is the most important, uh, uh, the most important part uh, of the work. These are some conceptual models that we were working. In this mo uh, ways of uh, yeah, of building with the concept, of course, uh, here I have to mention a person that I grew with. This was the first years of my, let's say, education after my studies, working with the architect Edward um, Wojtek Raunikar, uh, a very dear friend who passed away 10 years ago. Um, for whom the wall was the most important representant of the of the idea of the concept. This is one of his earliest buildings in Vrimsky Britov, a uh, post office and a shop behind an existing um, wall of the existing houses in this village. And you see some models that we use the walls. And when you have the walls, of course, you have to have the transitions and the transitions through space to space to another space. This is the parkour of the um, or a promenade through the rooms of the Schweizeria building that we res renovated recently. So this uh, passing through the walls uh, is a very important task uh, for us, how you enter, how you open the door and what you see when you approach um, to an opening. And one of the final elements uh, is uh, of course, uh, the open horizon. The open horizon is something that I always uh, look for to find it uh, as a, let's say, as an element to to make you think um, about the place you are uh, in, in on, on, on this earth. As uh, wonderfully said, our, one of our architects, Svetozar Krijai, the horizon is the, the line where all the struggles happen, the struggles uh, between the ground and the sky above us. And the architect somehow deals just on that line, trying to connect us with both desires to present the ground and the memories uh, with our wishes and the light and the sky above us. This image is the image of architect Joža Plichnik. Uh, it's a very beautiful intervention that I would like to share you briefly here with you. Um, as you know, I come from Ljubljana and of course Plichnik has a very important role in, in this city as Ljubljana is somehow stretched between Vienna and Venice. All the architects um, uh, before Plechnik and also after him somehow were somehow stretched between those two cities, mostly studying in, in the north um, and uh, longing usually to the south, to the Mediterranean, to the sea, to, of course, to Italy as, as, uh, as, our, um, as our inspiration. Um, so Plichnik is the most important figure of the first half of the 20th century and his architecture in fact uh, defined, uh, defined our city of Ljubljana uh, a lot. His gestures like you see here on this sketch uh, made uh, uh, or introduced to the city a much bigger scale, the scale of a big capital which Ljubljana in fact never was. So the 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 axe that you see that comes from his house to the Zvezda Park is one of the most beautiful axes and all the lines along the river, small river Gradaščica or big river Ljubljanica are big uh, gestures that have still in themselves a very small and human scale. And here on just the uh, top left side you see a small intervention that I'm going to show you now, it's on the castle hill where there was a small a ruin on, on the edge of the castle hill, there was just, um, just a small hill with a small remain of the ruin. So Plichnik built an alley towards this ruin. He shaped the terrain leading you to the hill and uh, he, cr he treated the hill like a cone. So he cut off the top of the cone and he built above the ruin a beautiful uh, bridge and a staircase. So through this 
gesture, somehow modest as it is, he touched the existing with a new element, uh, very slightly, but through this he reorganized the complete area into a, a running around space where people can move, cross, circulate, walk and of course observe the horizon. Here are some sketches of him and here is the approach through the alley to the area. You come and you see already the geometrically shaped terrain. You see the top of the cone and the road that goes just around it. So if you follow the way, you go around the cone and you see slowly the bridge. You are going under the bridge and you see forward a staircase. The staircase can bring you up to the upper level or you can go down and you go down between the circular wall and the ruin. When you come down, you see the ruin from the outer side and very slightly you can understand what in fact Plichny was doing because all the breaks that he did, all the things that he added are somehow um, more polished than the existing ruin that he somehow scratched even off to, to have it even more dramatical. So he here, for instance, he put like an arm above the scratched of uh, stone of the ruin or all these elements like this balcony are, uh, are very, let's say, gently put into, into the existing very um, dramatically heavy wall. Siri, here's the drama of going above, above to the stair. And when you go up to the upper bridge from, from the other side, you just enter the bridge and you walk on the bridge. You are now on the top of his intervention. You are somehow walking on the wall or even in between the, the outer perimeter of the wall. And when you come uh, to the corner, turn around, you, you, you see the city below you, you see the place where you somehow started your journey. So um, I think uh, this is one of my favorite projects of, of Plechnik and is somehow also connected with the work I am going to show you, not uh, um, my work, but the renovation of his house. Here are some projects of mine that you are going to see briefly a very small chapel reinvention, uh, uh, open air altar in Brescia, a renovation of a small uh, palace in Maribor uh, and the castle outbuilding in Ormos and perhaps if we have enough time the Schwitzeria uh, renovation in, in Ljubljana. Mostly in all my works I work with, uh, with the state like you see here on these images with the houses that are almost or completely abandoned, sometimes more, sometimes uh, less in ruins, filled up with cars, filled up with different layers of different times. So um, I try to show you through the processes of these projects uh, in a way, how we deal with them, how we work, just to, I hope it will be more clearly understandable um, how we uh, think about um, architecture. This is a very uh, small project, one of the first projects of mine you see here in the middle, the three bridges of Josef Lichnik, and uh, here behind is the Franciscan Monastery. I was invited to, to work in a competition for, an, um, for a small, um, for, for shops uh, in this monastery. So this is the Franciscan church and this is the monastery beside and the priests were thinking to build here a hole in this wall and build shops uh, to rent them to their uh, somehow people who help them in a way. And uh, I didn't win the competition. I just uh, got an, 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 a mention. But later, the priests who were who are owing this area changed their mind. They were afraid that the shops would be a big danger for their peace that they have here, and they they um, they decided to build here a small meditation chapel. So uh, the the Franciscan brother um, Silvine he called me. And he asked me if I would be prepared to do the project of this chapel. Here you see the entrance uh, behind the cars. 
into this wall and uh, it was the it was a, a challenge where and how to do the hole in into this wall because this wall is like a basement of this church that is carrying and uh, that is somehow binding together the church and and the monastery so I was afraid to make too dark it to make it too big so I was working a lot with this opening behind this uh, this uh, in the underground lever there were just two rooms two rooms like you see here is the hole in the wall and these are these two rooms so I decided to to build a kind of a niche and to put the entrance just close to the church wall so on the right side you see the wall of the church and this niche is somehow inviting you to enter so behind this entrance there is a ramp going down and then you turn around and you see the altar so this altar is held like an l-shaped wall and behind this uh, this wall there is uh, the place to put all the elements that they wanted to have they wanted to have a monstrance and the cross and we planned to do a staircase here below to bring the daylight into the underground and all these existing niches we used as a kind of a back side uh, of, of the chapel. So these are these three elements shaping the space, the white niche with the white stone of the interior, the yellow element which in fact is the grey stone, Slovenian stone that is um, holding the sacred uh, elements and the backside uh, wall which is a wooden wall like usually in the churches under the choir we have this entrance parts and the wooden furniture so uh, this is the model study of the light entering inside this is the niche of of the entrance and this is the ramp leading you down and seeing the back side of the chapel with the place where you can talk to the priest and the cross and the door the door is following the structure of the wall and uh, having some fractures to bring in the light and slowly uh, moving you from the outdoor space into the silence of the interior uh, because outside is a rushy uh, commercial street uh, which uh, is uh, uh, somehow the chapel was the place to 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 step out of, of the daily life to rethink your 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 things and to move out of the the crowd and be here in the silence today the chapel is closed uh, now uh, the the brothers uh, are thinking to build here a bakery so uh, they invited me to do here a bakery but i um i said thank you and i would not like to to do something i do not believe in uh, in fact, I don't mind if they change my uh, project, but I would not like to do uh, things I not really think, I'm not really sure it's a good thing um, to do on, on this place. Uh, when um, this, uh, this brother, Franciscan brother, who invited me to do the chapel was, uh, was, uh, asked to move to another village uh, they are moving them very often around so he's not uh, in the, the former chapel anymore so he moved to a village on the north west part of slovenia and um, he called me one day to come and see how he how he could renovate the area around this uh, church here this is the biggest pilgrimage church in slovenia and uh, here very often, especially in, uh, in the summer months, people come um, and gather for the Mass. So uh, he wanted, in fact, uh, as you see here, some trees. He wanted to remove all the trees around the church and build here a huge, huge square for all the people who stay outdoor uh, and have uh, uh, this Mass in, in the outdoor space in the summer church is too small to have them all inside so usually they were constructing an outdoor altar as you see here in front of the church and the the the, the, the space looked like that so the walls that you see were somehow were built already by Klitschnik in the 20s and through these walls he shaped the square in front of the church 
Um, this was a longitudinal square and the thing on the left side that you see, the wall, is uh, creating an, a park that is a bit above the ground. So all these walls are surrounding this square and it is very difficult uh, how to deal with them. We were asked to find the place where they could build an outdoor altar that could be shifted below the ground to be covered in the winter and coming out back in the summer. So um, the biggest question was where to place this altar, not to disturb all the important views. For instance, here you see on the western side the highest mountain of Slovenia, for instance, Triglau, a very important symbol of our country. On the southern part, there was a beautiful staircase and a wall done by Plichnik. And uh, on the eastern part was the entrance to the church, which is also a very beautiful church with some even modernistic interventions. So we decided and uh, proposed that we keep this park uh, that is on a higher level, that we keep all these perimeter walls that were created by Plechnik, and we propose to keep the facade free, to keep the view to the west free, east and west free and the south free. And we propose to put the altar here inside this wall, to put it, to shift it inside and to leave outside just the stairs bringing you up to a higher level. Behind this existing wall, we, we placed um, a storage room for all the seats and a small toilet which was entered before that from the front, we, we discussed them and convinced them to enter from the back side. So we kept all these existing elements and placed everything that was needed for today on the side of them, like the shops here in front. And we shaped this square, we kept the square, we kept the park and we, we wanted to have here also a front square in front of this. This part was was not realized that what you see was our proposal for a, a small museum that is now uh, being done by another architect. So this was the model of the area you see here on the right side of the park. You see the storage behind the wall and you see the altar. Um, we were thinking a lot about the materiality of this new, how could it be related to the existing. So we started to sample, to collect the samples of the stones like different kinds of treatments of the stones to be very close to the, to the existing stone. And of course, on the church, we found a beautiful element of a niche that was done in, uh, in the 20s by another architect, Plechnik's uh, generation, Ivan Gurnik. And this somehow is somehow connected also with our intervention of this door of, of this altar. This is like, uh, um, I don't know how is it called in, in English, but these are these Gothic altars that open their doors and can be closed. So it's like an element of, of that. And in a way, Plichnik already has uh, uh, built in his uh, one of his churches a closet. Um, no, in fact, it was an inspiration, this closet for, for this altar that was first built in a school that was used for a, a place uh, of um, of um, praying. This was a small closet that has inside a stone marble wall, and this was an inspiration for for this uh, for this intervention. This is the construction site, which, in fact, in all our project, is a very uh, quite. Um, uh, an interesting and uh, let's say uh, adventurous uh, work that we like a lot because uh, you discover many things and you have to change of course the project all the time. We are going there very often sitting and thinking about materials, discussing and trying. Here you see my colleague Martina who is, uh, who is uh, thinking about if we are on the right way. You see here the, the walls of the park that were stabilized by the new concrete construction and uh, so the square looks after renovation. Uh, some trees were removed here. This is the altar put on the side. This is the new pavement and this is the um, just the cleaned and um, 
um, stabilized uh, preachings wall. Uh, this is uh, how the altar works when it's no, no, um, nothing, no invent in front of it. And it's just a simple door um, that starts to open. It's not very complicated. It's a five meter door, but it's quite easy to open it. So you see the inside is different than the outside. It's a, it's a birch uh, um, um, wood and the light comes uh, from the back side inside uh, into the, the, the space where the priests are sitting. And from this you see outside and um, so they, over the stairs, they can approach the public and the stairs are built of stone, although all the other things are the concrete, uh, brushed concrete, and this is the renovated uh, park wall done by Plechnik. Uh, this is the park. Uh, we, we, some trees were unfortunately removed during the construction, but we wanted to keep this, this, um, this space that is in a way more, um, more calm. If the square is very public, this is a more private space for you to step out of the crowd and sit and think under under the trees. Um, here I'm going to show you a small project. This is the small orange one. Here is a town of Maribor. Uh, this is a huge river Drava. Uh, and this is a, a, a small palace. Here you see the castle. This was the part of the medieval town. And this uh, building was just put on the edge of the medieval medieval wall. You see the medieval wall, and this is our building here that is lying just on the edge of the medieval wall. Um, we were invited to participate in a tender to renovate this palace, but when we came to see it, there were no signs of really a palace. Only this uh, coat of arms uh, above the entrance showed that there is a noble house inside, but the inside of the building was really um, heavily um, changed. Uh, there is a tree inside that is backside of a restaurant. These were the inner rooms. It was really horrible state of the building. And the only thing we really liked, of course, uh, by these existing spaces was the light, how the light was entering inside the spaces through the south. So um, we were thinking a lot how to to deal with this existing structure. Because you see here, this structure, it's uh, just rooms, 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 and all the rooms were connected to the courtyard. So we wanted to open them and connect them one with each other. And we were looking long time where to place the infrastructure. And this is the most important part of the building, which in fact stretches also to the southern part. But we had the possibility just to deal with this northern part of the building and uh, we decided to introduce a pathway that uh, enables you to enter and to move through all the spaces and come at the end to the courtyard but on the same time you can enter also in the courtyard and go here inside and then above so we were mostly dealing with the organization of this existing structure and with the cleaning what do we need to remove that we would enable us to walk freely through all these spaces. So we proposed also to remove the infills of these arches that were completely invisible and to clean completely this room and to remove all the partition walls of this beautiful hall. And of course, it's very difficult to place all the nece necessary elements to go above, like the staircases or the elevators. So usually with those projects, it's the most difficult decision what to uh, sacrifice to, to enable these buildings to live um, in, in our times. So we decided to put the toilets and the elevators here in the corner and to remove this arched space to build here a staircase that brings you above. And when you enter, you can go up here and all around the corridor and go down there, or you can enter and come down there. So you can circulate or you can go up here and go down the other way. So um, this is the clean plan after the renovation. Here is a double height space because we found a huge cellar. And uh, this is the new entrance to the small theater that was established in the first floor. 
in the floor as well were apartments one apartment second apartment third apartment so we cleaned them and we came to the to the of course existing baroque structure which you see that was already there this uh, this promenade through the the spaces was already there so we just had to remove the the additional elements and we gained the beautiful open spaces as they were and of course here there was existing the first theater in the city and we found some traces of this space but not really much of it we created here an aula and here there is the small theater in the upper space all these orange colors are of course the demolition walls here is this uh, hall here is the aula and here are the cultural offices for the cultural center that is living today here in the section you can see this double height space here and the staircase creating another double space here and all these new elements that were added like enabling us to introduce all the, all the necessary infrastructure like heating and uh, cooling and ventilation and this is this double height space here on this side. Uh, we were allowed to add also some new openings because there were no information how the windows looked like at that, that time. So we, we, we could move into, into also new windows. Here you see the process of, of the construction. Here we decided to keep this veranda and just to renovate it. And through the construction, uh, lots of layers were uh, were really removed from the building. The layers of the pavements, like you see tons of, of different pavements that were built one above each other. And through this, slowly light started to enter into the spaces. By removing of these arches, we gained the new corridor and the new entrance to the culture center. And we found also different uh, um, stages of how the building was uh, in fact constructed. We wanted to keep them as much as possible to make it readable how the building really somehow was working in the past. So this is the entrance to the, to the small theater. This is the new uh, wall behind it uh, is all the, the infrastructure of heating and uh, ventilation. And here is the construction of the new staircase to the upper floor that you see now is built behind this wall so this is the staircase leading you up to the upper floor and uh, the removal of this vaulted area enabled us to go up and here you come to this aula in the first floor um, this first floor which looked like that at the beginning was slowly transformed this is the area of the new theater that has to be completely removed because of its bad construction and later it was built back again and this is the aula in front of the theater and after it's been completed uh, in the ground level we through removing all the plasters we discovered a new entrance that you see here in the middle of the image and this new entrance was leading us to the underground level so we decided to keep it and of course uh, we um, changed our project. We built a bridge that is going above this double height space. So when you enter from the square, you cross the old pavement of the former uh, level of the building and you can go down here behind to the underground level here, or you can cross the bridge and go into the uh, ground floor level spaces. So this is the bridge. This is the bridge, how it was constructed and the bridge leading you uh, over to the spaces. And this is the, the, uh, the level of the pavement that is uh, constructed above the ground of the former pavement. We discovered a beautiful former pavement here in this <coughs> entrance room. So this bridge leads you and shows all of the traces of the past. <coughs> This was a very heavy project, I must say, because um, <coughs> the municipality who paid it had just one year to finish the project and they had to fulfill um, all the needs uh, to respect the heritage institution, to, to respect the builder and to do everything in one year. 
So this is the team that was uh, the workers and they were always happy. Although we were worried, they were happy. So this is the room that is showing the layers. This is the, the passing through the, the rooms, uh, the corridor and the room uh, showing the infrastructure wall. And so uh, after the renovation, the, the light is entering back again to the rooms and uh, showing them in their own beauty without almost any, any trace of, of our work. This is the corridor in the ground floor level. This is the corridor in the upper level. Uh, this is a finding of a Gothic porch that we found uh, by the renovation. And this is the outer facade of this building, the entrance to the theater from the outside, the staircase and the new fans that is somehow following the, 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 the textures and the color, colorate of the existing doors. Uh, uh, and with its structure, somehow following the structure of the veranda be beside it. Uh, so somehow trying to bind together uh, old and new into a new uh, cultural center of Maribor. Uh, in that time, we were invited also to come and see a building that is laying beside the same river as in Maribor. This is the River Drava. And this is the town of Ormos, a little bit more to the east of Slovenia, close to, to Croatia and to Hungarian border. This is an interesting old town that was already uh, inhabited in the prehistoric times, especially this center. And um, this is the center of the town. This is the main square. And here is a castle that is on a high alp peninsula above the river. And this castle had here a service building. It's, it's called a castle outdoor building, uh, usually used for services. And the, what is interesting that this main road leads you just to the square in front of this building. This is a very beautiful area with lots of the heritage uh, and lots of the interesting traditional houses. Uh, but when we came here, this was the state of, of, of the, the whole site. Here you see the castle on the right side, and then here you see almost in the ruins this manner. Uh, but uh, first of all, we thought there is nothing lots to be really kept. But when we started to look closer, we found many, many interesting elements. Uh, and especially inside, there were beautiful vaulted spaces. And of course, there was this square that is overlooking to the center of the town. So there was already, there were some elements that really we wanted to keep. First of all, this U-shaped form of the building and of course the inner spaces. So we decided to organize the whole program that we were asked to build here inside this building because everything around it is a huge archaeological site that takes a lot of time and money if you want to build also outside it. So the only thing we could build outside was here where there were some wooden sheds already built and everything else had to be put and organized inside the building. So we created here a small square at the end of the, the town square leads you here and ends here with the square, square and the tree. And we organized here the program of a museum and here the program of the music school. This was the, the, the task that were, we were asked to put in. So uh, we uh, placed here a canopy above the entrances. This is the entrance to the museum and this is the entrance to the music school. So here in between, there is a program of uh, a hall where you can have a uh, or a concert of an exhibition. So both uh, programs are sharing this hall. And this yellow is the music school in the ground level. These are the classrooms and the teacher's room and the rehearsal room for the trumpet band. And here is a main hall for, uh, let's say, concerts. And this is the museum. The museum had beautiful different rooms, one above each other, uh, um, behind each other. And we wanted to, the concept of the museum is a somehow a pathway that leads you 
uh, from one room to the other. And in the upper floor, you go above and you return this way back, uh, passing through the working rooms and the offices and the children playing room down to the, to the ground floor of the museum. On the other side, the music school is having most of the, uh, the, the rooms in the first floor. They are shifted uh, because of acoustics, because no room uh, can have just one uh, 90 degrees uh, corner. So we, the corridor is treated more like an open space. Uh, the museum was first thought to be a national, uh, let's say, a museum of um, traditions from the area, but later they decided to build here an archaeological museum. So you see here this pathway leading you from the ground floor rooms, one above each other, to the upper floor, and the upper floor you can go down back again, or you can go on and uh, go down here on this side. So uh, all these orange rooms again are all the demolition and through this, this um, enabled us to organize the spaces as we liked. So this is the entrance canopy, this is the entrance, these are all the rooms and of the museum and this is the music school. So here again you see the construction site and uh, the materiality and the light entering to the spaces and slowly the shape of the new uh, started to come out uh, as a complete new space. And this is the space of the aula. This is the void that was done in the aula that you saw. And this is the aula after finishing. We decided to, to keep the vaulted brick ceilings and uh, through the process we decided also to have a lit brick floor because all the new interventions that we used are brick done. Uh, so here is the uh, main concert hall, the white hall, and here is the uh, here are the spaces of the museum, the, the room uh, that is now uh, renovated like that, the exhibition room and the entrance room to the museum. When you enter here, uh, you buy the ticket, you can have a small shop and this is the the exhibition of the museum uh, that is settled like small uh, micro ambiences where, um, where life from the prehistoric times is presented, like the hunter or the fireplace or the jewelry that was found in the urns in the graves. Um, we were discussing a lot about what material to use. So here you see the clay figures that were exhibited in the museum and the vessels. And slowly we decided not to use wood as the new, but we decided to use uh, uh, clay or mud or brick as the new intervention. So you see lots of traditional buildings, how they are done on the way to Ormos. We, we photographed many of them. And we decided to build new walls that we added to the building also in, um, in this way. So the inner spaces were created like the space for the sculptures and the space in front of the uh, music uh, rooms. Uh, they let in the light and uh, they let you sometimes also to have views to the outside. So the new first floor that was added and the new rehearsal room, they are all built out of the brick as well as the walls beside the, the uh, entrance and carrying the canopy above the entrance. Here you see the main square where you enter, go uh, up here above and uh, here is the main square in front of the entrance to the museum with the view to the, to the castle. So this is the square for people together and to have event, events in front of the building. And so the roof uh, is connecting the castle and the new building. And uh, of course, the brick is the same material as the roof and connecting the new elements in one, one, uh, one unity. Um, and now I would like to show you one of our recent projects. This is uh, quite a complex project. Uh, it's the project to renovate the house of our architect, Joža Um 
Pličnik uh, moved to Ljubljana after being abroad for a while. He was born here. He was educated to be a carpenter and he went first to Graz and then he decided to study architecture. So he went to Vienna to study in the school of Otto Wagner. You see him um, here. This is uh, one of my favorite photos of József Plecznik. Uh, this was uh, done while studying in Vienna and here he's, he's smiling and uh, usually in all his later photos he is a very serious man. Uh, here you also see him, uh, the second man from the right. This is Otto Wagner with his students. And later uh, all his uh, photos are very um, uh, very compositionally settled and he's a very he was a very severe person he was very strict he was a professor in Ljubljana for a long time but first after Vienna uh, studies he stayed in Vienna for a while and this is one of his most important buildings in Vienna the Zacherl House uh, one of the first uh, curtain wall facades before Wagner's post office was this facade built Later he went to Prague and uh, he was teaching there and he got a commission to work for the President Masaryk and did beautiful interventions in the, above the Hrachani um, gardens and uh, in the Hrachani park and as well as in the Hrachani castle. Uh, and in the 20s he was invited to return back to Ljubljana to become a professor at the end of the uh, 20s so he decided to come to Ljubljana. Uh, he was still working for Prague in the time, but from the end of the 1920s, 28, 29, um, he uh, constructed in Ljubljana until the, first, uh, the Second World War, beautiful and large opus of works. And among them you see, let's say, the river embankment of Ljubljanica, or the market space, or the cemetery of Jale. Uh, so these are big, big monumental works for the city, but on the other side, they offer this city where we live a beautiful human scale. These are all uh, public spaces. These are spaces that you can come and sit and don't need to pay a coffee or nothing. These are spaces that are somehow offered uh, to, to citizens to, to, enjoy, um, to enjoy living in the city. And uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, and I think Ljubljana not only became a capital through his gestures, but also got a very high quality of, of life uh, through the, the spaces he opened and offered to us. But he uh, was living in a very, very modest and small house. This is the house that you see here in the middle. Uh, and when he came to Ljubljana in 1921, uh, his brother, Andre, offered him to live in the house that he bought some years ago. This is a house behind this Ternovo church. And this is a small suburbia, quite close to the center today. And this house uh, was, uh, this is the plan of the house, was bought by his brother Andre, who was a priest, with the idea that all three brothers and the sister Maria would live once here together. So uh, first came Plechnik and he, uh, he, he was already sketching on these plans, as you see. And he bought, uh, he, he got just this part of the house, the right side of the house. And uh, he moved first to the first floor, you see here the staircase, the first floor, the, un the, the under roof, uh, there were three rooms. And he was first living here. Then uh, he was sketching and thinking, and at the end he did a plan to build a small addition to the, to the house. So you see here, um, this is the road that you saw before. This is the, uh, the existing house. And he was entering here to the house. Uh, this part was rented and he was living mostly in this area, uh, in the first floor in this area. Uh, later on, he built this addition. And this addition had a beautiful garden behind it. 
so he decided uh, this is the first edition and uh, uh, everything else you see was built later so this gray tower building you see here on this image this is a tower building that has a pitched roof above it and that's him standing here uh, here in this left corner was the entrance to the house so he was entering um, he was entering already from that side over this staircase you see him this staircase this was an outdoor space but later he decided to build here a canopy and built here also a stair uh, a columned room uh, like a hall to receive his guests so um, he built here this addition and in 1928 he bought also this house on the southern part to gain the entrance to the whole garden so in this time he also added a veranda to the garden so this house as you see is full of different additions and we were invited in fact to participate with its renovation here are some original photos that serve us of course as a, a guiding photos how to to what stage of originality in fact bring the existing uh, rooms uh, these photos were done after he died in 57 by his nephew who decided to uh, to keep the house as it was and it was really kept till our times with no big changes as a museum that is showing us how he was living and working and it is a very rare house usually in our country everything is renovated so we lose a lot of things uh, but this house remained completely original till our days so it was it is in fact a very important house for all of us architects we like to go here we have events here we were visiting the house a lot and uh, i was invited first to check the plan that was done for the house um, and i had some comments and so on but then they asked me uh, to do some details for this plan and in fact to do the execution plan and when we came the house was divided into two parts this is the part where Klechnik was living the brown part and the blue part is the part where the museum was working so you entered into the blue part and go around the house and enter the house and then visited the house and go back again this white part was a couple living here so in this white part there was a car parked and there was a there was a courtyard in the back side so um, it was the storage for this couple the municipality who is owing the part decided to uh, to find another apartment to the couple and to unify the whole area into one complex so this is how it looked like <coughs> These are the rooms, how they looked like. And of course, the house is a state monument. That means the highest level of protection. And this is the valorization showing us that this part is the most precious part and the yellow parts are possible to be transformed. So in a very precise description, you get the information what and how to keep and where you can also do some interventions. <coughs> So uh, studies were done, lots of studies, um, six years the studies were done. When we uh, started to do the project, uh, there was still planned to have the entrance and the same part. And here in the middle, there was a toilet. This was the service entrance and this was the public room and this was the reception with the small museum. So people would get here, go there and go to the museum. And we decided after looking to the spaces to, to, to change this a little bit. Because these rooms were looking like that, but they were still very beautiful. So we decided to put in the middle room the entrance lodger. We decided to, to place the main entrance to the main area where you see the patio and where you still see the house. So you enter here, uh, the, the reception man sees you, he welcomes you, 
and then you get organized. The visit of the house are very special. People come here and only seven people can visit the house with a guided tour. So usually they have to wait here in front. So you, they can see the museum exhibition here on the northern part, or they can listen to the film or have a lecture here in the lower part. So the toilets were not placed here in the center anymore. They were placed here on the side. Here it is a small shop and here is an open patio. So you can circulate around this area and wait for the guided tour, which is every hour. So the, the guided tour then takes place like this. You go through the museum, you go here, and of course, then you enter the house. And at the end, of course, you see the whole garden. In the upper floor, these are the working rooms. So you can also visit the upper floor and see all the rooms as well as the rooms of the custodians. So these rooms first were devoted just to the offices and to the storage. And they were so beautiful that we asked to present them also to the public. And this is the, the garden and this is the demolition of all the rooms necessary to organize the area. And of course the plan for the facade with the precise description. So uh, this is the facade and no big changes in fact were done here. Mostly the careful restorators just cleaned the facade and it's looking today like that. So this is the door that was just repainted and this is the backyard. There are big windows on the roof and we decided to uh, make them more less volumetric to hide them more in the roof uh, level uh, to present more the intervention by Plichnik. We had to remove unfortunately the greenery uh, above the facade and uh, of course stabilize the facade. So there were construction belts built around it and the plant was uh, moved on the side uh, but it uh, survived. So from this plant new uh, young uh, leaves are growing back again. In the uh, underground level we gained the space for exhibition because we have a new heating pump and we uh, mostly just carefully cleaned and uh, renovated the existing spaces like the entrance lodge that got just a new window above it and the veranda, uh, the winter garden that was just cleaned. This has a beautiful iron metallic uh, window frames that is a unique thing and of course the concrete grid of the winter garden which is an element I doubt today anybody would be able to construct it. So this is the winter garden and his kitchen in the existing rooms. And of course the, the tower building, the tower building that has uh, all this existing furniture with all the, the pencils and the working tools and his bed and fireplace and so on. Kept everything as it is. Of course, we were working a lot with the heating. We were working a lot with the fire protection with all the elements that I don't show you because I hope they were done in the way that you don't see them. In the upper floor, these are the rooms uh, where he lived uh, the first. So these are beautiful, modest, three rooms with beautiful windows and of course uh, an axial connection that is today a room for the uh, temporary exhibitions. This is the attic that was not used before and is today a working space for, for the custodians. There was no window allowed on the top and the only light enters from this window on the side from the lower part inside this, uh, this um, roof space. And most of the interventions of our office were done in the courtyard. So things were removed, things were replaced. Uh, additions were uh, demolished and slowly we started to gain uh, interesting um, uh, clusters and we found interesting elements and this is the new uh, new entrance to the shop as we decided to to uh, open it completely to the upper part and keep all these clusters that we found. Uh, this wall can be closed in the winter or completely opened and this is the door that leads you to the museum space.
This is a door that has a very interesting story. It was looking like that before. And first we removed the door and then we started to scratch off the paint. And uh, we discovered that this is just a mask above another door. And this door was a former farmer's door before. So uh, somebody decided to build a mask or a farmer door. And this is a method that Plechnik very often was using. So we found no really clear evidence that this is the work done by him, but the proportion of the door is a beautiful one. So we, we convinced the heritage um, or the general conservator that we may keep the door like that. Uh, and um, the museum, they wanted to have a glass door here inside. They said we wanted to, everybody to see inside and of course to, to lock the door. But we thought the glass door would not go well to this door. So we placed another door, a wooden door that can be opened like that and opened completely and invites you into the exhibition area. This area is also concepted by us. This is the entrance part uh, devoted to Vienna and Prague and uh, that leads you to the hidden part behind it that is uh, showing the his in unrealized projects. This is the room with his unrealized project. And in the biggest room, there is in fact the big model of Ljubljana with these three big, uh, beautiful windows and three important projects by him are presented here. Uh, this is the back corridor, uh, how it was before and how it looks today, uh, with the staircase going up to the custodian rooms and the lecture room. Uh, built also in uh, the former entrance uh, reception room. This is the shop, which is very, very small and low, but has windows to four sides and uh, is selling books and uh, some um, souvenirs of the architect's uh, uh, work. And this is the main entrance, the main entrance showing at the entrance part his photo, inviting you to the to the patio, to the entrance room, and uh, on the one side showing also a timeline with his work and uh, life uh, events uh, is a kind of an inviting area uh, for all the visitors who, who visit the house. The house um, uh, this is one part of the team that was working on the house. Uh, my colleague Masha, a very dear uh, architect, and Matyash, who was working mostly with the interior design and the exhibition. And this is the main conservator, Irena. Uh, this is the architect Matea, an advisor from the restoration office. This is the uh, restorator for the furniture and the main custodian, Anna. So as you see, this is a very interdisciplinary team in this project that was a wonderful uh, journey, this process through, through this uh, renovation and a very interesting uh, work to, the, to, to, of course, brought us to another and bigger understanding also of Plichnik's work uh, that we appreciate a lot and is appreciated also in our society, in the house, there are many events. For instance, the presentation of a new Slovene guidebook of his work. This is our ski jumper and the insurance office that are helping to promote this architectural heritage. In the house, you have events like discussions by the promoting of certain books. And as in our school, this photo is somehow following us. And also our students are in a way by living in, uh, in uh, his city, um, also somehow very much connected with, with his work. Uh, this is my studio in the school, the room that is um, having also one Plechnik uh, window. This is this beautiful window that he also inserted into the existing uh, walls of, of the facade of our faculty. So, this is, I think, enough for the end from my side. Thank you very much. Um, Arusha, thank you. This was really fascinating, uh, the, the story you told us about, about your work. Uh, now, uh, this, of course, is uh, for questions and some kind of discussion. Um, among you and, and our students and our 
our colleagues who are been listening to, to your presentation. Uh, perhaps we can, uh, uh, if you close your presentation, <laughs> that we can see you better or, I don't know, not really, but as you prefer. Um, so I don't know if, if we have some questions already, if not, then uh, perhaps we can start to, to ask some questions. Um, I was wondering when you, when you um, approach uh, or how you approach uh, your restoration work, if it is really like um, doing a kind of, of scientific research that you are very much, uh, let's say, um, exact, or is it more about uh, intuitive work, like um, artistic approach when, when you deal with with uh, uh, historical substance, because most of you of the work you have shown us is, was about restoring uh, old historical structures. Mm. Well, it's uh, of course the first when I come is of course intuition. I must say, if you go for a visit, you are always somehow inspired and touched by the spaces you see. So through years. Uh, uh, in a way, I learned that I have to be, in a way, passionate while seeing these spaces because uh, through the process they stay with you, these impressions. Um, then, of course, it depends uh, what, what is the level of protection of the building we are working with. Usually, all the buildings I showed you are somehow uh, uh, protected and they of course uh, have always a conservator that is following the project so for instance the last one the house of plichnik is a state monument and there was a lot of um there were really many uh researches done before the the project with some others this uh, this research is happening uh, parallelly with the project or sometimes we do the research sometimes also special conservators need to do the research um, so it it is a very interdisciplinary work and it, it demands from you a lot of discussion with the uh, people from the heritage uh, institutes like uh, conservators and lots of patients from both sides um, yeah this is it. Thank you. you. You have a beautiful um, text on your web page uh, by, by Luca Scanzi, an Italian uh, architect yeah. historian, and uh, he wrote about your work that this is actually a kind of restructuralization of the old uh, substance that you are doing, and that, that it has much to do with a uh, with, um, kind of selection. Uh, and it, he, he wrote there that is very similar to our way how we how we deal with uh, with uh, memories and with our uh, how to call it um, how, how our past that we are very selective when uh, talking about past and then uh, your work is also about selection and it's always uh, I mean very hard to to decide what you protect and what you simply <laughs> give away. <laughs> so, and, and as you sh uh, show us in all these examples, uh, you are sometimes very, very radical in, uh, in the way how you deal with the, with the old substance. So, uh, is it difficult to, to uh, work in this way uh, when you communicate, for example, with a memorial board or with a traditional representatives of the uh, how do you call it? Uh... <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I, I understand. Well, I sorry. <laughs> yeah, the people from the um, the conservators uh, usually see me as a radical, but architects or colleagues, architects see me as a conservative. So <laughs> there are two two possible ways of looking in a way. Um, it's not easy. It's uh, always a big uh, communication and sometimes it's possible more, sometimes it's possible less. It really depends on the, uh, on the, um, on the substance, how it really is. 
mostly what we are interested we realized very soon in one of our first projects that it's not possible really in a material way to connect all the new interventions you do sometimes it's also the void that is connecting new and old together that this unmaterial element of architecture as the void is um, is somehow binding uh, uh, let's say the the old and the new into the new totality so uh, we, what we are looking always somehow that this void is uh, uh, enabling you somehow a free circulation uh, that is opening this uh, somehow stuck uh, or built or closed buildings that is enabling you to 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 circulate around and freely inside them and of course what we are was a dealing a lot is to find the right balance between the old and the new. That uh, means um, uh, that we always discuss how much new do we really need. Now, uh, so this is the biggest task in a way and the biggest decision what, what even to keep and what, uh, what to add. Um, and uh, very often the conservators want more to be kept and we want more to be opened, no? Uh, and uh, so um, it's, a, it's a discussion. It's always, uh, sometimes it's, all, it's a compromise, but um, mostly at the end, I can say that at the end we are, with all that I worked together, we are still very good friends, respectful friends. <laughs> okay, sorry, we are back <laughs> again. <laughs> um, we we had some we had questions from our student, but this is nearly the same. Um, I have already asked. It's like when I can read it. Is it difficult to respect the original design and to add your personal thoughts? But I mean. <laughs> You already. I got that's, you this. That's what well, it is. Um, of course, you uh, your uh, your thoughts and your design are arriving from the existing. You don't do something completely out of the out of the space. Now, I was educated by this architect Wojtek Raunikar uh, that the context is a very important uh, starting point for your architecture. That you have to start from the existing. Uh, sometimes you have buildings around your plot and they influence you. Also, if you have just the desert, you have the horizon. But if you are renovating the existing building, you have uh, much more of the uh, information. Um, and then you have to, to, to select this information. You have to organize this information. You have to make a hierarchic uh, scheme, what is important, what is less important and so on. You, so you come somehow to to the the, the decision what you really want, and um, uh, afterwards you start to really uh, think uh, what is this idea now? What is the space? How how it works? Um, so it, it sometimes is uh, let's say in the house of Plechnik it was possible to do a kind of a loop, no? Uh, you can go up one staircase, you go down the other staircase. But in some projects, you can't even do this. You you just then perhaps you choose something else that is connecting the 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 spaces that is perhaps the materiality of the new that is connecting and binding together the whole. I think I believe that the old needs to be perceived like um, a unity or the layers of the old each other should be perceived like a unity and the new as well. No? So the new in a way, in a certain way has to be strong. No? Thank you. Uh, we have another um, question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very uh, personal question from our student. He's asking uh, is architecture for you a way of life or just a profession? Because it looks like it is your passion. <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, that you, uh, it's, 
I don't know, it's very difficult. This Zoom, I usually when I'm in front of many people, I can show this passion much more. <laughs> Here I feel a little bit blocked, but in a way, um, it's of course the way of life because uh, if I would work as a profession, I think I would work somehow out of me. But here I'm working like I'm working for myself to, to give, to, to offer the people as I would do it for me, as I would have it in a way, um, as I would open it for me. Um, somehow um, I don't, uh, I, I don't see my profession as being out of me. Um, I, I want to be touched as well at the end, as I am touched when I enter the existing structure. So, um, in a way, that's a big fear that you would lose uh, the spirit of the existing when you go out. In a way, when you do everything new, you clean, uh, then somehow the building becomes more sterile. And uh, uh, it's, it's often a big fear that with this you would make it dead. Um, so um, that's a big struggle. And on, on the other hand, um, I don't do, I never do just what I'm asked for. I do what I think is the best for the space, for the place, for the space. I, I struggle a lot to keep the, the square in front of the building, to keep the building open, to put the things in the right place. I, I, uh, it's a lot of um, negotiations, but not in the way of heavy, but trying to, to explain people uh, what would be good for, for, for them. And um, yeah, you, you need to be passionate. You need to, to know how to guide the dialogue with them. Um, that's a very important part of, of our profession, how you communicate. Thank you. We can uh, we can very uh, intensely feel your passion <laughs> even through the video. <laughs> but um, am I right when I say that that you kind of see it as a duty that you feel like you should present uh, the history to uh, nowadays audience, like to, to, to people that live now and to present them the past in a way that they can understand it and like to give it a new function? Well, um, I don't see the past as the burden. I, I, that's why I'm a bit radical with my buildings because I want to show the past as that enables us the same freedom as we have it also in modern buildings. Now, I don't see this as a kind of a, uh, a limit that it would limit our lives. Therefore, we struggle a lot to, to, in a way, introduce modern way of using the space and, of course, modern conditions. Um, but um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I missed your question. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I was just wondering whether you feel this pressure of dealing with yeah. something that is very uh, precious and like you have to present it to people now. But I think you. you yeah. Yeah. No, uh, I just wanted. In fact, I wanted first to to say something um, as. Um, I don't know, I think we all come from very similar environments. For instance, my country is um, a country of continuous discontinuity with the past. After the Second World War, our political system changed a lot, but it changed also in the past. And every time it changed, we had to forget everything what was before. And also in the 90s, our, our system changed and we had to forget all this socialistic past as something not valuable. So things were sold, things were demolished, things were treated like of no, no, with no value. And that's why I'm so struggling for the past because I want that we are proud on our roots, on everything what happened in our space before us 
and to show people that we can live and be even richer with that, that it creates our somehow background, our unconscious background. Uh, I think uh, with that, uh, this helps us to establish us as a kind of a nation with history. This material, material uh, <coughs> evidence as the heritage is, shows us that uh, valuable things were built before us, even more valuable than we are today building. You put it just perfectly and, and I mean it fits to our situation in Slovakia as well and we are, I would, I would love to hear uh, such a confession from, from our architects of today, unfortunately it's not really um, <laughs> the case, but anyway, uh, talking about the pressure, we, we have some more questions from students, but, but I would like to ask you, because you, you touched already the, the question of the pressure of that you can feel when dealing with an uh, important part of the history, and uh, I cannot imagine that you have been without pressure dealing with the family house of uh, Joseph Plechnik, it's something like Plechnik is, was looking at you and at the same time all the Slovenian architects were looking at you uh, a little bit jealous or even more jealous, so it's like I cannot imagine a more difficult position <laughs> like an architect to be dealing with a Jozef Plechnik house in Slovenia. <laughs> Because probably all of the other architects had their own opinion on how it should be done. So not only because of this, but, but uh, I see on in all your uh, uh, contemporary architectural discussion that Jozo Plachi is still somewhere behind. He is still there. He's moving around and in the <laughs> university and in discussions in all the magazines, etc. So it's like he's like a big ghost of, of Slovenian architecture, we do not have something like this in, in Slovakia, so how it was uh, <laughs> did you, for, for a ghost? <laughs> did you perhaps try to imagine what he would have done, <laughs> you know, like to, to see all this commission from his uh, perspective? <laughs> Yeah, these were, of course, the first suggestions. Uh, of course, we had a big committee behind us. We had lots of professionals who were uh, researching his work. And one of them, he said, oh, don't you worry. Do the windows like he would have done it. But uh, I don't think this is right, because what we wanted really to avoid to be uh, similar to Plechnik, we wanted to avoid this, that somebody would thought, oh, this was done by Plechnik, but in fact, we did it. We didn't want to have it. And on the other hand, we also didn't want to have something really minimalistic, nothing like being connected with him. So this was the most difficult part of the job, how to be somehow close to the charm of this existing building and not be too similar to his work. But uh, I can tell you a story about my relation with him. Uh, when, uh, when I started to work, I was waiting one day in front of the house. It was locked and I was waiting for the colleague to come and unlock it. And I was sitting on the fence, uh, turned with my back to the house. And I had all the time an impression that somebody is watching at me because, you know, this house is really a big, um, I don't know, we all love this house. We, my old colleagues, they like it and we all like to go there. And I thought, there's really not much to do here and we can do some mistake and whatever. And then when I was sitting, I, I had an impression that somebody's watching. And when I turned around, it was a poster with Plechnik's uh, photo. <laughs> <coughs> uh, so, uh, oh yes, yeah, so that, that is uh, terrible what I will do. And then we started and uh, in a way, through the process, um, we were talking a lot with many people and then uh, while doing the exhibition, of course, uh, some letters occurred uh, of him. He was writing with certain ladies some, some letters. Um, and they are also presenting, this letter is also presenting in the house of him. Uh, he had a very, he had many, <clears throat> he was never married, no? 
Mm. But uh, and um, but he was writing letters with Alice Masaryk, the the president's daughter. And uh, when he was older, he was writing letters with a pharmacist. She was from not from Ljubljana, and they were really very very beautiful personal letters that they were writing. And uh, uh, once she suggested him that they should why don't they marry because they were really on a very personal level these letters and then he wrote her back uh, a very um, very heavy letter a very difficult answer that uh, a very strict answer that uh, she misunderstood him completely he's completely devoted just to architecture and this uh, letter in a way somehow at that time really um, shocked me uh, how he was his relations to other people in a way not just to her but also to some other people who were working with him this uh, in a way it's a focus to the work but on the other hand not understanding anybody so at that time i stopped worrying a little bit no? i said perhaps if also we do a mistake nothing uh, he also did some, so um, th this liberated me a little bit. No? Um, I, I often worried because I, he, you know, we all appreciate his work a lot, but his personality, he was not an easy man. No? So uh, I, I often wonder how he could, being so reserved and so strict to the others, so religious, how he was able to create so beautiful, open, free uh, spaces in Ljubljana, you know? It's just the opposite of his nature, in a way. This duality intrigues me a lot, no? Um, in a way, it's beautiful, no? It's beautiful what he gave us. <laughs> Thank you. It seems like you really tried to understand even his personality, not just his work. <laughs> but that comes together probably. Uh, we have another question from a student. Uh, I would like to ask about the method of work with material. For example, the plasters. Do you prefer the traditional work? Because at some pictures uh, that you've shown us, there was a difference in the plasters on the walls. Yeah, uh, these were some existing plasters on pitch tip walls. These were some old type of plasters and we were thinking how to approach to them with some new plasters. So we usually try to work a lot with the, the, the shadow. In a way, we stay with the same materials, but we try to have different textures or more smooth, more rough and so on, just to... to do not be too contrast with with this. Um... Yeah. Okay. There is uh, another question. <laughs> uh, do you think the public should be more interested in architecture? How can architects influence that? <laughs> this is a good question. <laughs> yes, of course. Public should be more. Uh, or interested or involved? What was the question? Interested or involved? Interested. Interested, but perhaps also involved. Uh, yes, both. I think um, public should be, um, public should care much more uh, how they live, how we live. We should care much more about our living environment. And I think in my country, people don't really understand what are the right real values of architecture they think it's a beautiful facade it's the color of the facade it's the entrance it's the shape of the building they don't uh, think a lot about the space they don't think about the view they don't think about how space is free um, they uh, they see how the neighbors have and they want to have the same but they don't know how this really works so i think we need to get them involved uh, in the process, in the way of thinking. We need to speak with them a lot to show them that architecture still works, of course, in the field of the function and in the field of construction and in the field of beauty. And um, 
this level of beauty is of course the most polemical but i think it's a very important issue and i think the function is not understood in the right way it's just here and there but it's also the way how things are organized together now how they work together so i think uh, people um, see architecture mostly like form but uh, i think uh, it's more the space no and that that's what they don't understand no <laughs> you can't be that uh, judgmental and critical. I think it's normal for the public to uh, not being used to. You can look at the space as architects do. And perhaps the renovation of Plechnik's house is one of the examples of how even, you know, when, when tourists, I, I guess that it's not just architects that come there for the visit, but it's also regular tourists. And uh, do you think that that is the kind of house that can <laughs> involve them in the architecture? Yes, um, um, I, I can tell you, I don't know, uh, uh, it's a special museum, you know, uh, you are always received um, as a guest there and you have a guide and this guide are these guides are young art historians that are very passionate. They, you have one hour guided tour. You all have to come. You are really kindly invited. But it's a special museum that works in that way. You are not alone. So they take you around. You, they tell you the stories. You walk through the house. You circulate around. You use it uh, more or less, sometimes not everything. But uh, after these visits, they have books of impressions of all the guests, of all the tourists, they were there, that write really so wonderful comments to those guided uh, guides that they took them around. They are, uh, they, are, they, are, you, they are beautiful impressions that are in these books written down uh, because of the possibility that the house enables to see, to explain, to move, to, to talk and um, it's a kind of course also the user now the the guides and the museum uh, they are they are in a way the best museum in Ljubljana they work very well they they understand the house they understand how to inhabit the house and this is um, this is very important for instance in Ormos museum this brick museum they don't understand the house, they don't use it, they, it's always closed. <laughs> so it's, you know, I, uh, we have to teach first the user how to feel free in your architecture. Now, this is um, sometimes going better, sometimes not so bad. No? No? So. Uh, thank you. We have uh, still one more question. But it's even it's, it's quite a, a long one. Uh, one of our students says, uh, "I will start with saying a big thank to uh, you for the presentation." And my question is more conscientious, uh, but I will try anyway. <laughs> In almost every project of yours, we can see that you are giving a big uh, accent to a, to an entrance to the building or to the intervention you are designing. You are putting a big deal as well to the doors in the entrance. Maybe we can see this in the project of the meditation chapel and uh, then at the open altar project and after that at the entrance to the palace in Maribor with the, with the stairs. My question is, um, uh, my question, is the entrance playing that big deal in every project and the way we design it with all the elements from the materiality to the placement, or should it be more subtle in reconstruction projects? <laughs> it's like a very complicated question. But, but basically, the student is, uh, has noticed that the entrances are very articulated in all of your projects that she's shown us. Mm. Is, that, is that true, or it's not something that's 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 question, uh, because uh, he's right? Uh, I. I pay a lot of attention to the entrance. I think uh, the entrance is the way how you, um, how the building greets you, how it says hello to you, how it addresses to you. Of course, it, it, uh, it depends on the, on the program, it depends on the scale, it depends on the right measure between the building and the entrance. 
but um, I think it's the first contact, uh, your first contact with the building is, of course, the entrance. So um, sometimes it can embrace you or sometimes it can be pushed out there, like in the National Library of Plichnik, he wanted people to push hard to enter into the building in the National Library. But uh, we usually are try to be more gentle, to build a canopy above the entrance, to build a roof, to, um, to, to have a more smooth movement of the door, to, uh, in a way, um, enable you uh, to approach it and to be received by the scale that is um, balanced with the human scale. Um, after this, uh, I would say, pragmatical question that was not answered in a pragmatic way, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I have still one of the question and it, it regards um, uh, a place where I, what I love very much, this is Blatt and the Lake of Blatt. And, uh, and, and as I noticed, you, you won a competition for, uh, for a lake promenade in, uh, I don't know, it was several years ago. Uh, what happened with the project? Did it stop or, or it developed somehow? Yeah, we, are, uh, we, we, we did an execution project for a part of this uh, uh, area and that is still waiting to be realized. So they are they were planning to, to build it to, to start this year, but uh, they have some organizational problems and uh, uh, so they are putting it uh, every year on and on, but I think they will start next year. Uh, it's, um, it's a small, it's a, it's a promenade on the most beautiful part, which tries to mostly just clean the area and present the beauties of the site. It, it, it was really beautiful as I saw it, and it reminds me of the of the images that you shown us from uh, from uh, Plechnik's interventions uh, around the Lukovica uh, River. It's really something very subtle and, and uh, but very important of organizing the life of people around the, these wonderful yeah. places. So I, I'm really very much looking forward to it, and, and uh, wish you good luck that it will really be executed. Thank you. I, I just don't show, usually in my lectures, I show just uh, things that uh, were finished. Um, at the moment, these are quite old because we have now four construction sites. So, um, yeah, I have not really big recent things. I have just small, uh, small things, but um, yeah, <laughs> next time I will show you some, those that are now in, in the construction. I mean, it was beautiful what what you have shown us. So thank you very much, and uh, and we do not have uh, more questions from the side of our students. So perhaps we can um, we can close our our session uh, today. Uh, I would like to thank you very much. It was really amazing uh, how you talked about architecture and all your work is really we are big fans of, of it. <laughs> Oh, um, thank you very much. <laughs> really kind of you. Thanks a lot. You are very welcome to come to Ljubljana as soon as the the virus is cleared out. Uh, please come. I will be pleased to take you around. Really, um, <laughs> I'm sure that also our students will uh, visit uh, Slovenia after this uh, lecture of series that we have. <laughs> I, I hope so, and and you yeah. are of course invited. To Bratislava and we will give you uh, culture through our uh, 30s and 60s uh, architecture which is also uh, beautiful and we are fighting for to preserve it. So thank you again Marusha uh, for, for uh, being with us and uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation and really was of the students, you are all invited. Uh, if I will not have time for all of you, I will uh, ask my students to do the guided tour. So <laughs> just come. I think we will all be traveling when the virus is over. We <laughs> just traveling. So, yeah, uh, I hope so. I hope so that it will happen. So, thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Marusha. Have a nice evening. And it was. Uh, thanks, Gerdit and Monica. Thanks a lot. Take care and bye. I hope you bye. bye bye. Yes, bye bye.